Right. So we've talked about x-rays, um, but now I want to put it in a, into a little bit more uh, grand perspective um, and also, also give you a little bit of an insight into the history of small angle scattering. Uh, so you might know that small angle scattering is actually very, very old. Um, so when you then look upon our magnificent, magnificent new machine with all its, uh, all its fancy features, you might start wondering um, how, where, where did all of these ideas come from? Where did all of these features originate? Um, so I will take you through the history of small angle scattering, stopping by a couple of these things on the way. Now, I like doing this. I like going into literature and trying to find out the first time that somebody really tried something, and you never really know where you will end up. Um, this is also my disclaimer. So I don't claim to have the first example of anything. Uh, it's just the very first example that I could find with, 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 my, um, with my limited uh, available time. If you find any earlier examples, I would be very happy if you could send them my way. Um, and I will, uh, uh, it's, it's basically, yeah. It's, I, I, I would really appreciate it if you can find, if you can beat me, right? Um, so during this talk, I will use a timeline. I will not go through this thing completely chronologically uh, because it turns out that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but I will divide this talk into, into some segments. And these segments are highlighted by sort of by sort of the first time that they, uh, that they came about. So I'll first talk a, little, talk a little bit about the theory development behind the small angle scattering. Uh, then onto some instrumentation developments that started going on uh, after the 1930s. Um, we then have uh, developing developments of analysis methods, um, detector improvements, and data improvements towards the end. Now you'll notice that my timeline starts in 1915, but it actually um, should start in 1895. And the reason for that is explained in another segment of this, uh, of this wonderful General Electric's video that we had earlier on. Late in 1895, in a little university laboratory in Bavaria, Professor Wilhelm Conrad Rentgen first noticed the strange effect which led to the announcement of his discovery of x-rays. And although the news was received by the public with a mixture of disbelief and apprehension, doctors immediately saw the possibilities of the mysterious new rays and began to use them. All right. So yeah, x-rays came about around 1895. Uh, but the first evidence for people talking about small angle scattering that I could find comes from 1915, and that is from Piet de Baye. Um, he published a paper called The Scattering of X-rays, and um, publishes in his paper this equation, and that is a very important equation. You'll see it appear um, in software even to this day. What this equation allows you to do is to calculate the scattering pattern based on, uh, on selecting point pairs, random pairs of points inside your objects. And these points can be electrons, they can be atoms, or they can even be just, uh, uh, just generic blobs. Um, so this is used for calculating scattering of proteins, but it's, I also use it in the sponge, which you will hear about on Thursday. Um, the Bayer used this to calculate the theoretical scattering of hydrogen, but I haven't actually m noticed any practical experiments until uh, 1922. So by that time, X-ray diffraction was already known, and here you see the diffraction pattern of diamond that they measured. But in 1922, they also measured something uh, about uh, uh, some, some liquids. And liquids behave completely different, as they found out, than their crystalline counterparts. So this is the signal for benzene that they collected. And the things they noted were best explained in 1928 in a review paper um, about, uh, on scattering of liquids. What they noticed was that in liquids, this small angle scattering intensity does not quite go to zero at zero angle. It also has a maximum uh, in water. This is your water peak, which seems to correspond to the distance of molecular separation. 
uh, and they then correlated the, uh, the position of this peak with, uh, uh, with the molecular separation by measuring uh, straight carbon chains, fatty acids, and alcohols. And it seemed to agree quite well. Uh, the first in situ experiment uh, I found was from 1933. This is from Kratky, who later on went to explain, uh, who later on went to develop the Kratky camera, uh, which I will show a little bit later. What he did was uh, he took a fiber, uh, sorry, a filament of cellulose, stretched it, and by analyzing the scattering behavior around the beam stop, he could then correlate uh, the changes in internal structure with the differences in the scattering, by the differences in the scattering behavior. Remember that in 1933, it was still fine to, uh, to go and send your kids off to work in the factory to earn a little bit of extra money for your, uh, for your family. Child labor was perfectly fine. Um, in 1939, we see some instrumentation developments which are very specific uh, to small angle scattering. Now, uh, X-ray diffraction instruments had, had, of course, existed before. Here's an example from, from Compton uh, of a De Bayer-Scher uh, geometry uh, uh, X-ray scattering or X-ray diffraction camera. Um, but in 1939, uh, we find the first example of the three-pinhole collimator, or in this case, the three-slit collimator. And this is essential to good, to good scattering. Um, the problem with just using two slits is that uh, both of these slits uh, show quite a bit of parasitic scattering. Um, and this makes it very difficult for you to measure a small angle sc scattering signal uh, immediately around the direct beam. So what the third slit does is it doesn't actually touch the beam, but it just takes away this parasitic scattering uh, in the best way possible. So essential to good small angle scattering. Um, one other interesting uh, thing that I came over uh, that I um, that I found was the first mapping experiment. Uh, so here was uh, Van Kuchen and Mark in their uh, in their laboratory on their laboratory X-ray generator had taken some capillary X-ray optics, brought the beam down to about 50 microns in size, and probed a filament of nylon as they were stretching it, or well uh, after it had been stretched in different locations, and they could then uh, analyze the local structure of this nylon filament. They also noted that um, if you really want to do small angle scattering on this, uh, you will need to evacuate your camera. Uh, so yeah, this, completely, this idea of completely evacuating our X-ray scattering camera to lower the background uh, is also from 1944. Uh, this is a picture of their instrumentation. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got an X-ray generator on the right-hand side. It's got a, I think it is a counting system on the left-hand side. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but you, you can see that, that their small angle scattering instrument isn't actually, uh, isn't actually evacuated yet in this configuration. Um, 1949, uh, there's a nice review paper from Baldwin and Baer. Um, that mentions many of the um, many of the developments that are in current use at the synchrotrons and in the labs as well. So they talk about using crystals for monochromizing, monochromatizing your X-rays, um, using high-intensity X-ray tubes. I think this is the time that the rotating anode generator was being uh, was being conceptualized. Um, or focusing your X-rays by curving your crystals, or using total reflections from um, from polished uh, uh, polished glass plates, for example. Now, this is not self-explanatory, uh, as I found out. Uh, in particular, the focusing by means of curved crystals. I came across an instrument. I will not mention names. I came across an instrument. Which uh, where they wanted to focus the X-rays, and what they had done was they've taken a block of silicon and cut out a parabolic shape out of that block of silicon. This does nothing for your focusing because the crystalline lattice is actually exactly the same. So the X-rays don't bend; they they don't they don't they're not reflected to different angles. They're reflected to the, to exactly the same angle. So um, apparently, not all lessons from the past are remembered. Anyway, 
1957, we get an interesting development. Uh, this is when um, Anton Parr and his daughter, Margarete Platter, developed the first commercial sax instrument. Uh, so Margarete Platzer was a fine mechanical engineer uh, who could build all the, uh, all the fine components for that instrument. And um, we have one of, the, one of those instruments here. I'll just bring it before the camera. There we go. So we have one of these instruments here. It is, as you see, a very modular system. It would not be used in the configuration that it is now. I've just managed to put everything on the one rail. Um, but it has a lot of components that you can, that you can take off and, uh, and rearrange in any way you want. If you want to, do, if you want to detect the x-rays on this camera, you're either, uh, you either have to use these photographic film holders to collect a whole scattering pattern in one go, um, or you would have to put a counting tube on, um, uh, on the motorized stage at the back and then stepwise measure every, sc every scattered angle individually. Um, I think, or what I think this is, is very much uh, an instrument for research, uh, not so much for production, but, uh, but I don't know exactly what happened in that time or what these machines were used for, but uh, it's interesting to see where they came from. Right. Yeah. Um, 1959. Uh, I like this paper. It's not very well known. It's uh, Hermans and Heikens. They were two researchers, I think, in a Dutch uh, industry laboratory. And they were measuring fibers. And um, they were interested in measuring their fiber scattering uh, on an absolute scale with proper background subtraction. And I applaud that effort. That, uh, and the method they came up with, in theory, would have worked, I think. So what they did was they had uh, envisioned a machine with three photographic films, one for measuring the primary beam intensity, one to measure the backscattering from the tungsten wire to get the uh, transmitted beam intensity, um, and one photographic film at the end to capture your scattering pattern. So what you would need to do in this case is develop all three photographic films simultaneously exactly the same so that the blackening on the film would be, uh, would be comparable. And in that way you can, do your, you can do your corrections to some degree and get your data out in absolute units. Um, they did produce some practical results of this instrument, but I haven't to be honest, I haven't seen a lot of uh, results afterwards. It could be because it was an industry laboratory. They, maybe they weren't interested in producing uh, or in publishing more practical results. But in my opinion, this is a very complicated way. Uh, it's a, well, photographic film isn't the nicest to work with. Uh, it's a very complicated way of getting, the, um, of getting these absolute units. But I think they deserve, uh, they deserve credit for trying. Uh, 1967, we see a nice development when it comes to measuring ultra-small angle scattering. So as you remember from our talks, uh, the smaller the angles that you measure, the larger the structure that you measure. So if you measure the ultra-small angles, you measure, measure ultra-large objects. So these uh, instruments use, uh, in this case, channel-cut crystals um, to very well collimate your X-ray beam and then as an, angle, uh, as, a, as an angular selector with a very narrow angular bandwidth, uh, to capture the scattered radiation. Uh, I've built a couple of these. I'll be happy to tell you a lot, a lot about this um, if you're interested. Um, stepping back a little bit in time, we have uh, the analysis method developments in 1946, which I think are worth mentioning. Now, up until that time, um, your options were essentially linearizing your data. Here is a particularly egregious example from uh, Jelinek. Jelinek was a PhD student um, in the lab of Fankuchen, if I don't remember, uh, if I don't uh, 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 misremember this. Um, and during his PhD, he said, okay, um, you know when you linearize your data, you're supposed to plot your data with, uh, with your x-axis in a particular way, in this case, the square of the uh, wave vector transfer. And the intensity issue should be on the logarithm, the, the natural logarithm of the intensity, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not completely crazy. Um, and you're supposed to find a straight section. And 
By taking a ruler, you can then um, you can then draw a line, and by analyzing the slope and the intercept, you can find out um, uh, some morphological details from your sample. Um, the problem is you can't always find a straight section. So Jelly next said, well, I can't really find a straight one straight section, but if I put enough straight lines together, I can sort of approximate the curve that I get. And if I then plot these structural details that I get, it looks a little bit like a size distribution. He correctly noted, however, that uh, in his paper that, uh, you know, it's, it would be premature to take too seriously these computations of particle size distribution. However, it seems to work somewhat. Um, the reason I bring this up is because since then, every couple of decades, somebody goes through the literature and finds this method and goes like, ha, ah, this is a nice way of calculating a particle size distribution. So you see this coming up in the 1980s and later on in the 2000s as well, uh, under different names. Keep an eye out for it. Um, I have shown in the past uh, on my weblog that this is not uh, this doesn't actually work. You can't do this in this way. Um, but, uh, but it's an interesting mention. Um, didn't they have anything better? Well, same year, 1946, there's this paper by Rus, who uh, actually um, uh, has a practical inversion method available. So. Inversion methods is where you take your x-ray data and you transform it from uh, reciprocal space back to real space and you get a mass length distribution out. And this is incredibly useful. This is essentially uh, a particle size distribution uh, which you can use directly. Um, the problem with this method is with the integral in this equation. This goes from zero angle to infinity. But you've not measured from zero angle to infinity. You've only measured maybe one, two, or three, in our case, three and a half decades. Um, and there's an infinite number of angles below that and an angle, infinite uh, number of angles above that uh, that you haven't measured and you need to assume. And the problem with assumptions are that, well, <clears throat> um, that they don't always uh, reflect reality. Um, so depending on how good your assumptions are, how applicable these assumptions are for your extrapolation of your data, uh, these methods might or might not work. Um, this wasn't used back then so much because it does require you to compute quite a bit and um, linearizations were a lot quicker and easier. Uh, but they did exist back then. All right, but until 1978, um, approximately, your option was linearization. And depending on the complexity of your system, you might have to linearize in a very, very complicated way to get a straight section out and get some structural details out. Um, I don't recommend linearizations anymore. However, 1980s, uh, we do see the least squares model fitting uh, coming up. So this is, uh, this is one example from, uh, from Martin Hollenby, uh, a recent example where he applied this. What you do here, is you describe your scattering as um, uh, with an approximated scattering model. So if the structure in your sample is almost like spheres, then you might try uh, fitting, uh, you might try assuming that it is spheres. And for spheres, we know exactly how they scatter. Um, you can then uh, adapt the parameters of that sphere to try and match your data the best you can. Maybe add a polydispersity, as Glenn mentioned, and in this way, uh, describe your data as close as you can. And this is a good way of describing your data. It should be applied to as much data as you possibly can. In this case from Martin, which, which is why I bring it up, it is actually used both for uh, neutron scattering data and for X-ray scattering data uh, uh, simultaneously using a single model. Um, so using one model fitting two data sets at the same time, I thought that was really, really cool. And um, just to show you how complex these models can become, this is the model that he used. So these structures were sort of like donut structures inside liquids, where the donut is actually a little bit flattened. So the cross section, uh, the cross -section of, of this donut is then an ellipsoid uh, with a particular aspect ratio. And by using this fitting, fitting method, you can get all uh, all parameters out. 
Uh, inversion methods were also still being developed. Um, in 1999, we have the um, generalized inverse Fourier transform, which again inverts your data, gives you a size distribution out, uh, gives you a size distribution. But as before, still contains a couple of adjustable parameters which nobody really understands. Uh, well, sorry, which people might understand, but I don't understand, okay? <laughs> So there's a, there's a smoothness parameter. Also, you're also supposed to stop the iterations for this, uh, for this inversion process after a particular number of times. And the, there's no real strict criterion about when you're supposed to do this. Um, we also came up in 2013 with uh, our own method, so Maxas. It's a Monte Carlo way of analyzing your data. Uh, seems to work quite well. Uh, we'll talk about it more later. Now, a lot of the drive for these, uh, for these improvements in the analysis methods were, uh, were coming from detector improvements. So the data got better, uh, which didn't allow for so much freedom to be taken anymore in terms of data analysis. Um, this meant that we needed better analysis, model, analysis models uh, to fit that data. So what kind of improvements did we see? Well, before 1978, your options were using a counting tube with no position sensitivity but photon counting ability, or using photographic film. And um, this was good for two-dimensional patterns, but uh, the intensity wasn't that easy to correlate to actual uh, flux. <coughs> you also had the option of wire chambers. Uh, so this. Uh, these are delay line chambers. You have a single wire inside a gas chamber. If you um, hit that detector with a photon, you generate a cloud of electrons. This hits the wire, creates a pulse. And by the time it takes this pulse to travel to one side of the de detector compared to uh, the time it takes to travel to the other side, um, you can estimate where on the detector this had hit. Um, these have relatively low count rates. Uh, they do count photons and relatively low count rates because you can't have a second photon arriving when the pulse of the first one is still traveling up and down. Um, however, if you have enough money, you can build this into a two-dimensional detector as well. I've also used these. Yes, they do count photons, and they're position sensitive in two dimensions. Um, they do have some distortions, and the count rates are <clears throat> uh, abysmal, I would say. Uh, they go to about 100 photons per second maximum over the entire detector. This is not a lot. Um, in 1990, in the 1990s, your options were a little bit um, extended. You had CCD detectors coming up, uh, which didn't have enough of a dynamic range to really be much of a benefit in, uh, in small angle scattering. And you had image plates. Image plates, we talked about that before. These are uh, plastic sheets with uh, radiation sensitive material, which you can bend. Uh, you can also cut holes in them. You can, you can shape them any way you need. Uh, so they're kind of flexible in that way, but you do need to manually take them out of your machine and read them out and then erase them on a different, uh, on, on different machines. So labor intensive. 2003, however, um, there was a massive, uh, uh, well, this was really a big, big shock uh, to the small angle scattering community uh, or a big improvement in the, in the small angle scattering community in terms of data quality. That's when we got um, this detector. This was developed by the detector group at the Swiss Light Source. And what this is, these are um, uh, panel detectors containing a silicon chip. And, uh, on the, uh, and this chip is divided into pixels of approximately 172 by 172 microns. And behind each of these chips is a counting circuit. So behind each chip is, a, is an amplifier, a discriminator, and a counter. Um, which means that you can count very, to very, very high count rates to this. Every pixel can count up to a million counts per second, um, which is great for the synchrotron, right? So this first image, which they collected, might look horrible now, but it was really, really cool back then. Um, so you could collect this at the synchrotron, and of course there were a couple of dead panels there, there were lots of hot pixels. Um, you will notice from the, uh, from the detector itself, each panel is tilted a little bit, 
which means the calibration was uh, painful. Um, I think I actually worked with this machine, uh, with this detector at the CSAX beamline in the Swiss light source, and it uh, produces a lot of data very fast. And um, yes, it is nice and linear. Calibration was a little bit annoying. There have been lots of improvements since then, so the second generation was already a lot better in terms of build quality. Uh, you see the image on the right is virtually free of, uh, of, uh, of artifacts. They also don't, uh, don't, the detector panels don't overlap anymore, so we now have a, have a straight detector. Um, but yeah, these, I mean, great detectors, I think, um, I don't think many are using a different type of detector. I don't think anybody else is using a detector quite as big as this because these are pricey. For each one of these uh, panels, uh, you would pay back then, 2005 or something, you'd pay about uh, $100,000. So a detector like this would probably set you back a cool $6 million. Um, so pricey. And that's not, uh, that's not even the, uh, the, the most expensive example. This is where they've taken a lot of those panels and put them in a semicircle. And um, as these are not actually cylindrical, these, um, these panels, uh, it is a collection of flat panels. And doing the data correction for this is currently causing headaches with uh, our colleagues at the Diamond Light Source. Um, but nevertheless, very nice detector, very expensive, and uh, collecting a lot of data, hopefully very fast. Um, so lastly, almost lastly, I wanted to talk about data improvements. Of course, getting better data isn't enough. You also need to store that data in a, in a structure that you can use. And in 1998, oops, um, in 1998, there was a group coming together in Grenoble. This was the, uh, the Kansas group, a group of scientists from X-ray and neutron facilities who said, okay, we're producing our data in this format, you're producing your data in that format. I can't use your software, you can't use my software. Can we maybe make a translation tool to translate between the different formats? And um, what they did was to try and then develop a universal data format, which um, took a little bit longer than just writing a translator. But the, the initial idea was to write a translator. Um, meanwhile, in 2000, there's this uh, work from um, Malfoy and Svergun, um, who, were, uh, who were interested in generating or uh, creating a universal data format for biological SACs. Um, this, I believe, is a, consists of a three-column ASCII file with a header where you can put some data, where you can put some metadata in. And I like this quote from their paper. They say that a consensus in the small angle scattering community has been reached. And anybody who knows, who has worked with scientists, uh, knows that a consensus is probably the last thing that you'll ever reach. Um, that uh, brings me to um, uh, to this comic. Uh, the idea of which I stole from Tim Snow, so you might see it again tomorrow. Um, so where there are first 14 competing standards, and then somebody comes along and said, what, 14? That's ridiculous. We need to develop the one standard that covers everybody's uh, use cases. And then there are 15 competing standards. So along that principle, in 2009, uh, the Kansas group came up with the Kansas 1D format. This was, again, for one-dimensional data with some metadata in there. but used XML, and that isn't the easiest uh, data format to use. Um, however, there has been development since then. Uh, we got the Nexus data format. The Nexus data format allows you to store data from new, uh, neutron, uh, X-ray, and muon instruments in a hierarchical way um, so that you can uh, write your data in such a way that it describes itself. Uh, we have an example for that coming uh, later today, I believe, where we'll take a look at some of the files, Nexus files, that we create for the mouse. Anyway, what this allows you is it allows you to store multi-dimensional data. Uh, you can go up to five, six-dimensional data if you need. Um, together with all of its metadata, uh, these can be images, these can be other multi-dimensional data sets in a single structure that uh, describes your experiment. So you can uh, add things, whatever, whatever information you have, whoops, 
whatever information you have. Beam information, so we actually store uh, a detector image of the direct beam with every uh, measurement. We store sample information, um, instrument information, how was our instrument configured, what were the slit sizes, what was the generator set to, was it still running. Um, information on the user and in information on the environment, what were the temperatures, what are, what's the humidity and so on. Uh, all information which is probably not useful to you but might be useful when you're trying to troubleshoot this thing um, and maybe something has gone wrong in your instrument and this is one way to find out. Um, anyway, the demo, demo for that will come a little bit later. I just wanted to show this. So this Nexus definition is a, uh, is a structure definition on top of the HDF5 format. HDF5 has been developed by the Department of Energy as a general container for data, multidimensional data with hierarchical metadata. Um, Nexus says if you use that for neutron, x-ray and muon data, then please put it in that structure. And then uh, the Kansas group came on and said, if you, you, if you want to store your um, corrected small angle scattering data in there, please use the NXS definition, which defines exactly where you should put what piece of information so that your analysis software can take, uh, can take this and analyze it. Um, this is what that group looks like today. So yeah, lots of, uh, lots of young people. Here is uh, Tim Snow, for example and uh, Greta Jensen, who's, who's over here. Uh, Pete Jemian, also a big person in the field, of, who is, is over there, uh, puts a lot of effort and time into, um, uh, into all of these standardization work. If you're interested, like me, in things like data corrections, data formats, um, integrating sample environments in instruments, uh, multiple scattering flags and so on, then this is a very nice and fun group uh, to meet with. Um, so yeah, data improvements, I wouldn't say they're done, we're still working a lot on them. Um, but uh, what are we doing now? Now we're making sure that we have the methodology in place so that, um, so that you don't just get data, but you actually get good data and the right data on your experiments. Uh, that's all I want to say, except to return to this and say how old is this, uh, how old is this instrument really? Well. If you look at the age in which some of these things were conceptualized, you can calculate an average age, and it would be about 1967. Of course, not quite true. There's a lot of additional improvements that have, that have, been, that have come on to the original ideas. But uh, I thought it was a nice way to put this in perspective. Thank you all very much for your attention, and I will happily take any questions you might have.